Coming up, we're going to be talking about Donald Trump saying that a former an FBI director could be named soon. Also, it is the end of the internet as we know it. Potentially, we'll break down the FCC's first move to roll back net neutrality. Plus, Alibaba profit takes a hit, but China's e-commerce giant dazzles on revenue. We'll head live to Hong Kong and put its fourth quarter gambles under the microscope. The EU sends a message to big tech with a $122 million fine for Facebook. How the Bloc and the UK are pushing tighter web security by clamping down on social media's biggest players. First to our lead, President Trump insists there has been, quote, no collusion with Russia. Speaking at a news conference with the president of Colombia, Trump called talk of impeachment totally ridiculous and says he didn't ask then FBI Director James Comey to back down on the investigation into Michael Flynn, his former national security advisor. He also said he'll announce a new FBI director very soon. Meantime, the legislative agenda hangs in the balance, including on issues like net neutrality. On Thursday, the FCC voted to start to unwind net neutrality rules put in place by the Obama administration. On one side, you have Internet service providers like AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, now barred from creating so-called Internet fast lanes. On the other side, tech giants like Facebook, Google, and Netflix could be hurt if the government starts interfering with the Internet. It's a proposal FCC Chairman Ajit Pai has been pushing since day one in office. Larry Downs closely follows this topic as project director at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Also with us from New York, our guest host for the hour, Tech Economy CEO David Kirkpatrick. David and Larry, thanks so much for joining us. So Larry, I'll start with you. What does this mean in terms of what exactly happened today? What are next steps? So no, nothing today happened that matters at all in terms of the short term. This is the beginning of a long process of review and comment. It will be several months before the FCC votes. And then when they do vote, all they're really talking about now is undoing this, what was done in 2015, the reclassification of broadband as a public utility. They haven't said they're going to undo the net neutrality rules themselves. They're looking for alternative authority under which they can keep them. Does it matter that the FCC keeps reversing itself on these issues? Oh, it does. I mean, it's terrible. Obviously, you can imagine for tech companies and for ISPs, this kind of uncertainty, this back and forth, it's like Groundhog Day. Um, the solution everybody understands in the long term is for Congress to act pass a law, make clear what the rules are, make clear the FCC's authority, and get us out of this mess. David, you know, how do you think the uncertainty is, is impacting the tech companies like Facebook, like Google, like Netflix? I mean, clearly they don't like flip-flopping uncertainty, but I actually don't think it's hurt them very much. I mean, first of all, these companies have so much money they can spend a few more dollars on lobbying if need be. But honestly, um, I think the, the basic point of view I have on the extreme rhetoric that's been surrounding this discussion is that it's really overheated and not appropriate. That there's never been any real sign of fundamental uh, in, impropriety on the part of carriers, even though there certainly could be. We actually haven't seen any. So the, I see there's sort of an anti-corporate mindset among many people that leads them to just plain suspect that AT&T and Verizon and others are going to be nasty players and therefore they ought to have rules to prevent them from possibly doing things down the road. But you could easily make the same argument about Facebook and Google, which are the ones supposedly celebrating the fact that the rules are being, you know, changed. Or, or, or complaining about the fact the rules are being changed, sorry. Larry, are we ever going to consider, are we ever going to be able to consider the issue settled if the rules keep changing? No, I don't think they'll settle, as I say, until there's actual legislation. By the way, there was legislation proposed in 2015 before the FCC took its last action here. Uh, it was seven pages. It laid out what net neutrality was. It gave the FCC authority. At that time, it was introduced by Republicans, Democrats expecting they would hold on to the FCC with a Clinton presidency, weren't interested in, in uh, you know, conversations about it. Now, maybe with this action, we might see some, some movement on the Hill. Is there anything approaching a compromise? Well, the, the bill... Because the debate is so polarized. No, the, as, as David says, the, the rhetoric is, is completely overheated and, and really off the charts as, as it was, you know, every other time we've, we've been through this. Um, I was testifying a couple of weeks ago for the Senate. Uh, both the, the chairman of the Commerce Committee and the ranking member agreed that legislation is the solution. Uh, they just don't think the atmosphere in Washington is really uh, appropriate now for those kind of discussions. Maybe, as I say, that'll change with today's actions. Now, as we know, you are, you, you are on, on, on one side of this debate, and explain why. 
So I, I, the side I'm on, by the way, is the side that's against public utility treatment, not against net neutrality rules themselves. Uh, public utility treatment for ISP is really inappropriate. Uh, it will hurt investment. It will obviously slow down the way in which we do, uh, you know, new innovations, new network investments. Uh, it hasn't uh, had much time to have that take effect yet, but we're just one FCC chairman away. And by the way, the next Democratic FCC chairman is going to undo what this one did, so we'll just be right where we started. Uh, we could start talking about things like rate, rate, rate regulation, unbundling, all the things that will really kill uh, investment. David, you know, on the other side, uh, obviously, are, are the technology companies. How would they respond to what Larry just said? Well, I think everybody would like to see clear rules of the road, and I think in fact, even though Facebook and Google and others have sort of s supported the overheated rhetoric um, critical, uh, criti criticizing uh, the FCC's decision, um, I think it's, it would be positive for all players if Congress actually focused in methodically more on the reality that the internet is one of the fundamental drivers of the American economy. And as a result, we need to really think methodically at a policy level about how to make it grow in every respect. And I do think that's something that Republicans and Democrats, and to some extent right and left, activists, non-activists, all more or less agree on. It's healthy that we're having a debate that's forcing Congress to think about it more than they have, because in general, they haven't thought about any of this stuff nearly enough. How long is this going to take, Larry? <laughs> well, it's been 12. How long are we going to be talking it's about? It's been 12 it? years so far. <laughs> uh, so, you know, happy anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, we will keep talking about it until Congress acts. I don't think anyone And when is that going to happen? Well, uh, as I say now, the, what the Democrats are saying is the climate in Washington, not just about this issue, but obviously in general, Clearly. is completely toxic. Um, the FCC could vote, uh, you know, in three months, four months on this proposal. And in that period, I think we've got an opportunity. There's pressure now. There's going to be a lot of public. We're going to hear so much more rhetoric. You can't even imagine what we haven't heard that we already heard today. That may give us the opportunity over the next three or four months to get something done in Congress. I'm cautiously optimistic. All right. Larry Downs, Project Director at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Always great to have you here on the show. David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy. You're sticking with us. Well, Tesla may be at record highs, but famed investor Jim Chanos isn't sold. Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker caught up with a hedge fund heavyweight at the SALT conference in Las Vegas, where Chanos said Tesla stock is not worth a whole lot. Tesla will be dependent on the Model 3, and that, that all, all of the other nonsense notwithstanding, uh, that, that at the end of the day, the company is not worth what it is trading at today on its current business, and if you don't believe me, just look at what Elon Musk was quoted in the papers today as saying he's, he himself said the stock is not worth $50 billion. Coming up, Salesforce out with its first quarter earnings, profit and revenue topping estimates. We will break down the numbers next. And later this hour, we'll hear from Jenny Lee of GGV Capital, one of the best known global VCs who spent over 15 years investing in Chinese startups. This is Bloomberg. Salesforce is getting a boost. The company upped its annual revenue forecast as it continues to attract more customers with a broader lineup of products. It also reported first quarter revenue of about $2.3 billion, up 25% from a year earlier. Still with us, Techonomy CEO and our Bloomberg contributing editor, David Kirkpatrick, and with me here in San Francisco, our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson. Let's start with the highlights. Uh, continued growth of Salesforce growth and you know the uh, Salesforce the numbers are kind of baked in right they, they give us this deferred revenue number so we have a real good sense of what's going to happen in the next quarter so what you want to see with this company is maybe deferred revenues will start to grow faster than revenues grew suggesting that things are going to get better but in fact deferred revenue is growing at about the same pace as revenues uh, and growing at about 24 percent on a year over year basis which is really good but it's slower than it's been in years right. past. Right. So question is, can they sustain it? Yeah, and the, and the question is, what are they doing to sustain it? I mean, you know, it, it's growing fantastically. It's even throwing off uh, a free cash flow. Now, the company lost money in the quarter. They like us to look at adjusted numbers, but they actually lost a lot of money in the quarter. But I think it's important to look at the fact that they've done uh, billions of dollars in acquisitions, and yet growth is coming uh, slower, mind you, at a fantastic pace for a very big company, but uh, much slower than it used to be, even though they spent billions of dollars uh, to aid that growth. David, whenever we talk about Salesforce these days, we have to talk about the threat from Microsoft increasingly stepping on Salesforce turf. You know, how well positioned is Salesforce to defend themselves? 
Well, I think they still define the industry they're in. Uh, Microsoft is a formidable competitor for anyone anytime they really train their sites on, on, a, on a market. But I don't think, I think Salesforce has plenty of room to grow, plenty of room to further consolidate their position in the market, even as Microsoft has room to expand its position in this space. Because the reality is every company needs these kinds of tools. And you know the, the idea of cloud-based software for running your enterprise well beyond the sales function, which is what Salesforce is now focused on, and obviously Microsoft too, is you know that's the way the business is going to be run as we go forward. And, and it's, what impresses me about Salesforce is that they've really kind of captured the imagination of Wall Street and to some extent the larger world in a way that no other enterprise company has done um, for a lot of reasons, beginning with the extraordinary salesmanship of CEO uh, Mark Benioff. But um, you know, they really do. They they were the begin. They were the first with a fundamentally new approach to running enterprise software in the cloud, and they're still getting the benefits, and it's important. We're getting headlines from the earnings call happening right now, Corey. Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, saying that they expect to grow nearly 30,000 30, employees this fiscal year. What yeah. do you make of that? Uh, you've seen the building Huge. going up here? Yes, the building, by the way, uh, they for don't people own. who don't live in San Francisco, if you're on any edge of the city, it's the tallest thing out there. It is the tallest building west of Chicago <laughs> in the U.S., and typically that's been a rough time, uh, uh, strangely, for companies when they, the, the edifice complex it is known, and when they build a big building and put their name on it, the stock tends to fall. Uh, that has not been the case thus far with Salesforce. Uh, they don't own the building, they're just putting their name on it, but it is, it is quite a sight to see in this city, and it shows you kind of uh, the focus of this city being this big company of Salesforce. I want to show you a function on the term that shows us how the market reacts to Salesforce earnings. It's the SURP function, the surprise function. And what it shows you, uh, it, it might look a little complicated on the screen, but when, when you see this function, what it fundamentally shows you is how much the company surprises by, when in this case uh, they beat sales by 1.57%, uh, which I'm circling there, and it shows you what the stock market reaction is. So the price change of the stock tends to be 3%, 3%, 5%, or 4%, 4%, 11%. So the market tends to react to this stock when they beat the numbers slightly. The stock tends to have about a 3% move, an average of 7% if you look over the last 10 quarters. Uh, and, and yet this is kind of a muted response because I think the market's kind of used to seeing these companies beat and raise. But when they start to look at other things, they're going to start to see this slowing growth rate. I think that's going to matter. There's a there's a command, my favorite command of the terminal. Do you know my favorite command of the terminal? Uh, what is your favorite it's command? It's EM. It's the earnings matrix. Okay. And it shows you uh, the numbers from every quarter in a quick matrix and then the percentage change and I think this is such an important thing you can see when a company is accelerating in terms of its growth or decelerating in terms of its growth and what we see from Salesforce is that deceleration of, of revenue growth that was growing at at 35 percent 33 percent 32 percent 24 percent you know, now this 25% quarter is, is, is less than we've seen in prior years, and that's not great news, again, as I mentioned, after spending billions in acquisition. Well, if they do grow to 30,000 employees, that is about twice the size of Facebook, about half the size of Google. Well, it, so we'll think about launching. that, right? There's, there's so obviously a lot of room for them. It's a capital-intensive business, and we're starting to see those limits. Okay, Corey Johnson, our editor-at-large, thanks so much for that update. David Kirkpatrick, Techonomy CEO, you're sticking with me. Sticking with earnings, shares of Cisco fell the most in two years after a disappointing forecast. Cisco says revenue in the current period may fall as much as 6% from a year ago. The company also says it's cutting another 1,100 jobs. Cisco currently faces challenges from the shift towards cheaper software-based networking. Bloomberg Daybreak America has caught up with Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins and asked about the success of the transition so far. The software and subscription transition, we have more than doubled the amount of, of dollars sitting on our balance sheet from software and subscriptions in the last eight quarters. And it was up 57% last quarter, now hit 4.4 billion. So that transition is moving. Coming up, members of the UK government are proposing a sweeping new web security law while also taxing tech giants. We're covering big, big tech news out of Europe next. This is Bloomberg. In the UK, Prime Minister Theresa May is proposing a new tax be levied on tech companies in order to fight web-related issues like hate speech, privacy breaches, and cybersecurity. Bloomberg's Caroline High joins us live from London and still with us in New York, Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick. Caroline, though, I want to start with you. What is the purpose of this new tax and what companies are going to be mostly affected? 
It's fascinating. This is all coming out in the so-called manifesto of the Conservative Party. We're running up to the general election, June the 8th, which the Conservative Party are due to win by really quite some margin. And they've come out today with part of this manifesto proposing a law to allow the government to impose levy on what they call social media and communication service providers. Now, they don't name particular companies. They don't say how big these levies, these taxes could be, but they notably say that will support the awareness and preventative activity to counter internet harms. Basically, they're saying, look, some people think the government shouldn't regulate on this. We disagree. The government should be regulating these sorts of technology movements and the internet. And of course, this comes hot on the heels of the WannaCry ransomware attack, which really took down a lot of the hospitals, the big infrastructure in the UK. This is striking why the iron is hot. This is something the public wants to hear. They want to see some sort of a fight back and protection for those who use the internet, particularly children and particularly against hate speech and fake news. Is this something that could set a precedent for other countries? I think this will be fascinating because, yes, it can. Already, though, this is something we're seeing spread across EU-wide. I mean, we just this week saw France levy fines itself. They said they're going to be hitting a maximum privacy fine coming Facebook's way. This is to do with data protection issues. We've had Germany, remember, bringing itself towards its own election in September. Merkel's party, the leader of Germany, are also considering what would be the strictest laws ever imposed against social media giants, such as Facebook, they're considering imposing fines of 50 million per pop if ever you saw Facebook refusing to take down certain content or not being able to hear or see options to complain for those who use the likes of Facebook and other social media giants. So this is something ringing out across the EU, Emily, and interestingly, of course, we just got Facebook being fined 110 million euros by the EU today. Why? Because they say, look, you gave us a missing, well, incorrect, factually incorrect data back in 2014 when you were looking to buy WhatsApp because you said you couldn't merge the data between WhatsApp and your other platforms, and you did back in August. Right. They did say, though, that it wouldn't have changed approval of the deal. So I wonder if it's a bit more of a slap on the wrist. David, mm. you know, what do you think? The EU has obviously taken a very aggressive stance towards these technology companies. Is the law the best way to handle big issues like hate speech, like privacy? Well, that's such a big question. I mean, I think informed law enforcement would be very beneficial in the era of the Internet. But we have to be very careful given the degree to which these companies are defining the future economy and beloved in many respects by the citizens of every country and you know if they get impaired they're not the citizens aren't going to be happy which is why governments want to show that they're concerned about privacy but they don't want to come down too hard on these people on the other hand from facebook's point of view when its profits this year are going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 12 billion dollars it's not going to you know really hurt them too badly but I think, you know, Carolyn's right. This could very well be the beginning of an era of kind of, kind of a death, not death, but harm by a thousand cuts. As governments all over the world feel, they've got to show that they recognize the weight that these companies have acquired in society, and they feel like they've got to do something, quote unquote. But I'm not sure that governments generally know what to do because they don't really understand how these systems work, and there aren't really good alternatives to the way they're working now in many cases. And David, I'm fascinated by your opinion, sat on the other side of the Atlantic, as to what really the EU is doing about some of these tech giants. Because as you say, they are such valuable companies now, Apple still dominating, Facebook um, up amongst them. And we are seeing 30 bi 13 billion being issued Apple's direction in terms of back taxes. You're seeing Google not with one, not with two, but with three investigations coming from the EU. Do you, does the tech community in the US see this as heavy handed from the European Union or think game on? Yes, definitely. Definitely it is seen in the U.S. by me and by the industry generally as quite heavy-handed. Um, but, you know, there is a flip side to that. In my opinion, at least in the EU, we've had a consistent pattern for the last couple of years of the government, the EU government, and it's, it's many quite tech-savvy areas, you know, trying to understand what, like I said before, the problem is these businesses ha have a weight that no companies have ever had in society. They have numbers of cl cl clients and customers that no companies have ever had on a global scale. So how you deal with that is extremely problematic. In the U.S., we've had an incredibly laissez-faire attitude, and I think it's probably healthy. The Europeans are looking at it, but I don't think that fining them for little privacy things is going to accomplish anything. 
Still several EU probes open into various tech giants, namely Google. Uh, David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy, you're sticking with me. Caroline Hyde, thanks so much for that live report from London. Sticking with Facebook now, the company went public five years ago today. Going back to 2012, investors were doubting if Facebook could make money especially on mobile. CEO Mark Zuckerberg was criticized for buying Instagram for a billion dollars. That was just six weeks before the IPO. Then there was that rocky start, of course, shares trading below the IPO price for the first 14 months as a public company. But we know now how the story has turned out so far. Facebook is now one of the largest tech companies on the planet with a market cap of $425 billion. Its shares have jumped more than 280% since May 2012. Coming up, Alibaba shares fell in Thursday trading after the Chinese e-commerce giant's quarterly profit missed analyst estimates. We'll discuss CEO Jack Ma's plans to boost revenue growth next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Iran struck back against sanctions that the U.S. has imposed with some sanctions of its own. It penalized seven entities and two individuals, including the CEO of Booz Allen Hamilton. Iran votes on a new president tomorrow. Incumbent moderate Hassan Rouhani helped orchestrate the nuclear deal with world powers. France convened its cabinet for the first time, a calibrated balance of 22 figures from the left and right. But there are concerns President Macron's office wants to control the press. Some political reporters say officials called their organizations and tried to designate specific journalists to cover Macron's visit to Mali tomorrow. In the UK, Prime Minister Theresa May has committed her Conservative Party to a hard Brexit. May outlined the party's election manifesto today. She promises British voters she will deliver a clean break from the EU and warns again that no deal is better than a bad one. U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price visited Liberia, the West African country where Ebola killed more than 4,800 people. He toured a community hit hard by the virus in 2014 and praised Liberia for its remarkable cooperation on health care issues. Russia's foreign minister laughed off reports suggesting President Trump shared sensitive intelligence with him. Sergei Lavrov says he didn't understand what the secret was since the U.S. revealed the potential for a laptop terror attack when it banned them on airlines from some Mideast countries. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Thursday here in Washington, already 7.30 Friday morning in Sydney. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, a little bit of a comeback today in the U.S. Good morning to you. Good morning, Elisa. Yes, and we might see some of that flow through to Australia as well. ASX futures currently off just a shade, about three points. Uh, keep an eye on Fairfax Media today. It had a very good day yesterday against a falling market, up 6.5%. Uh, this on news that a bidding war uh, for the newspaper giant seems to be emerging with uh, Almond topping TPG's bid for around about $1.25 per share. Uh, Nikkei futures also looking positive, and uh, the Nikkei may well have cracked uh, 20,000 points. Points on Thursday were it not to, for the uh, dramas around the Donald Trump presidency. Uh, we saw a very strong GDP print there. Other things to watch out for, MGM China earnings, first quarter GDP out of Malaysia. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Let's continue our coverage now. Tech earnings, shares of Alibaba falling in Thursday trade despite strong quarterly revenue growth and plans for a $6 billion share buyback. Investors focused instead on the Chinese e-commerce giant's quarterly profit, which missed analyst estimates due to a large tax bill and investments in cloud computing and digital entertainment. Joining us now from New York, Selena Wang, our Bloomberg News reporter. Selena, let's start with what surprised investors the most. 
So the minute the earnings were announced, we saw a huge drop in the share price, and that was largely because of this earnings per share miss that you had just mentioned. And a big reason for that was because of a big tax hit. The effective tax rate went up quite significantly, and investors later then pared back the losses in the share price because I don't think the concerns over this tax hike was too uh, too serious. It was because of an investment they had made in Sooning, and uh, that a tax break had, had since expired. Uh, another area of potential concern, though, is pressure on the margins. Alibaba's core e-commerce business is still growing quickly, but they are rapidly expanding outside of retail into areas like cloud and entertainment, and that is putting pressures on margins. But there was was a lot of uh, hope and and a lot of uh, right spots in terms of growth in that revenue core e-commerce retail number. It shows that they're able to squeeze more dollars from these brands by getting better content, targeting users much better. What kind of progress are we seeing in these new areas like cloud, like media? So we continue to see triple digit growth in these areas and we continue to see very large losses as well. In the cloud business, there were still losses even though some investors had been hoping that they would get to at least break even at this point. And part of the reason for that is because there is very strong competition in the cloud space from Amazon Web Services, from Tencent. And so they've had to continually cut prices in order to gain market share. Now in the entertainment business, it's similarly a very cutthroat space. Uh, Tencent has been rapidly acquiring content, as has Baidu. And Joe Tai on the call even said that, you know, it's a very hot market right now. And hopefully the prices will come down over time as this market starts to neutralize a little bit. But right now they're having to spend very rapidly for content. What are the macro drivers helping Alibaba? So Alibaba is able to benefit from the growing Chinese middle class, even though we did see some industrial numbers come in on the weaker side in April, the Chinese consumption has stayed very strong. And Alibaba has also been able to capitalize on the rural population, which is still a very untapped part of the Chinese market. In the rural areas, there is not very good access to offline retail. Therefore, online retail provides a very important pathway to get a lot of goods and services that weren't available before. And also, Alibaba has made big investments in offline retail and that shift to mobile. So they're trying to kind of bridge the difference between online and offline retail. All right, our Bloomberg News reporter, Selena Wang there. Selena, thanks so much for that update. I want to focus now on the broader investing climate in China. Since joining GGV Capital more than 10 years ago, Jenny Lee has helped put the firm on the map in China, investing in companies like Highsoft and Didi Shuxing. While climbing the ranks as one of the most recognized VC investors in the world, Lee is based in Shanghai but is in San Francisco this week, and we got to speak with her about what has changed in China over the course of her long career. I've been in China for 12 years now and then covering China f since 2001, so for the last 16 years. Um, I think that the most significant change that we've seen is the quality of the entrepreneurs. Right? So 15 years ago when you go meet with an entrepreneur, first time entrepreneur, first time reading a term sheet. I think today the entrepreneurs are a lot more sophisticated, um, one. Two, the internet market is just a lot bigger, more mature and you have a larger user base. And what that means is that we're now talking about innovation. You launched GGV's China operations in 2005, and you know the landscape has changed dramatically. I mean, mm -hmm. China changes every day, let alone every year. What has surprised you most? Yeah, so it's, um, well, I think the size of the market has always been the most interesting uh, aspects of China, right? Well, it's not just the tier one cities. Uh, it's also the tier two, tier three cities where people are talking about innovation, where people are saying, we don't have to work for the government now. We can come out and make something of themselves. So the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, I think it's one that's it's something we've seen really change over the last 15 years. So there are several phases of technological change when it comes to China. You could say the first is PC internet with Alibaba and Baidu. Then it's mobile with companies like Xiaomi. Now it's online to offline. What's next? What's the next big technological shift right. that will happen in China? Right. So the next area is something that I've been spending quite a bit of time on. Uh, it's what we call within GGV frontier tech sector. And this is one where we're looking at core technology, uh, new products that are changing uh, each of the new vertical and usage uh, in China. 
Um, and, and so that's the exciting part. I've been spending a lot of time with more geeky folks looking at cool products uh, and cool services. You also talk about something called Beyond Silicon in terms of what's next when it comes to AI and machine learning. What does that mean? Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of Frontier Tech, maybe to give you a little bit more um, background in terms of what we look for, there are three big areas. The first area is all about transportation. I think anyone who's been to China knows how bad transportation there is and that there's still a lot of room for change, whether it's land transportation, air transportation, or, you know, like water, sea transportation. So in that area, um, we, are, we are looking at the whole, whole ecosystem around autonomous driving. And so there's a sensor at the, at, the, at the base that talks about computation. We talk about sensor fusion. And so the algorithms, the software part comes in. And then we talk about complete cars, electric cars uh, in China, which is a huge market. So that's like the, the one uh, big area. The second area we look at is the whole area of uh, robotics automation. And in robotics automation, we are looking at home robotics. We're, to we're talking about industrial, um, you know, using robotics for the, for the industries. Um, and then uh, the very cool area there is really drones. Right? When you think about drones, they are robotics to a certain uh, aspects. But these are robots that fly uh, in the air. These are technologies that run into a lot of regulatory issues here in the United States. What is the regulatory landscape like in China? Yeah, so the government is actually very supportive of this area. In their 13 five-year plan, they actually outline very specific areas. Like these are all the areas that has been highlighted. The government is going to invest uh, and encourage, you know, the um, development of this industry by either promoting, you know, R&D, giving grants for R&D, supporting the schools to educate more students around this area. Uh, literally in the machine learning and AI area, uh, which is the third big area that's coming up, they have committed to spend over 15 billion US dollar in the next two years in this area as well. So I think um, government is very supportive. They're stepping up in terms of not just policies, but also in terms of real tangible dollar. Um, to pro promote the industry as well. U.S. tech companies have consistently had problems entering China. Facebook and Twitter still shut down. Google is out. Uber is out. Airbnb is trying. Right. Will Airbnb have any success where these others have failed? Well, I think that at the end of the day, if you do come out with a very good service, but that service has to be localized mm. for the local consumer, then I think they will be successful. So you think that's why Facebook and I'm a, Google, I'm a product. I mean, they were all in Chinese. <laughs> well, I think that being being in Chinese is not enough. Um, the usage behavior, the consumer interaction. If you've been looking at WeChat, and if you use WeChat, you know that's the idea. That's the baseline that a Chinese consumer would measure any competing product with, which is their homegrown products. And so I think that to compete in China, you have to understand that that nuance and be able to really, you know, address uh, the local consumer need. You think Facebook will ever be unblocked in China? Will Google ever get back in? Well, I think that um, if they do come back in, they need to come to the market with a new product. Something very different. That was Jenny Lee, their managing partner at GGV Capital. Coming up, KKR has been investing in tech startups for decades, but has recently stepped up its game. We'll explore where the firm could really make a splash next. And if you have a moment, check out our new interactive TV feature on the Bloomberg. Find it at TV Go. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message. You can ask a question. You can play along with the charts on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Honeywell is starting a $100 million venture fund for technology companies. And the office will be located at ground zero for Silicon Valley Venture Capital on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park, California. Honeywell plans to take stakes in 50 to 70 startups. Private equity giant KKR is also launching a new fund, putting more than $700 million to work in the fields of tech, media, and telecommunications. Here now to discuss the fund and potential deals, I want to go to our Bloomberg News IPO reporter, Alex Barinka, who's with Vincent Letary, KKR Growth Equity Director for Tech, Media, and Telecom in New York. Alex? Vinny, a, a private equity fund, when you think about the investment strategy, I compare that to venture capital, which isn't necessarily thinking about the exits like a private equity fund mm -hmm. would. Uh, with this new growth equity fund, as you're jumping into some of these growthy mm -hmm. tech unicorns, what, is, what are you all thinking about that's different given your focus on the exit? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Alex. So I think one of the things that's really interesting now is companies are just staying private a lot longer than they have historically. If you look back over time, companies tend to stay private for six or seven years on average, and today that number is 11 years. And so these companies need a different type of investor to help guide them through that process. We think a lot of the skills and capabilities that we've built up as a firm over the past 40 plus years can really help these companies get to a size and a scale and maturity where they can either become a viable IPO candidate or become a valuable asset for a strategic acquirer as well. One of the recent investments is Lyft. Uh, I'm curious, Lyft is the smaller of the two US-based drive uh, rideshare companies. Why Lyft, why not Uber? It's a great question. Uh, Lyft is a business that we've known for a long time. Uh, we respect John and Logan, the two founders, uh, incredibly. They've assembled an amazing team. Uh, they've built a great company. Uh, we've looked at investing in the business a number of different times. Uh, every time we checked in with them, we were really impressed with the progress that they had made, but there was always something that kept us from investing in the company. Uh, early on, that was regulatory risk or questions around whether ride sharing would really be adopted on a mass basis. Uh, later, it was questions around, you know, can they get to attractive unit economics? Can they control cash burn? Uh, when John called us you know, back in late 2016 and said that they were contemplating a capital raise, because we had built a relationship with him and because we knew the company so well, we knew exactly what to look for. Uh, and obviously, we liked what we saw because we ended up investing with the company. Vinny, it's Emily in San Francisco. Do you think companies like Lyft's competitor Uber and Airbnb are making a mistake by waiting so long to go public. We've seen Snap uh, come out of the gate very quickly. It seems to have gone fine. Uh, should these other companies be thinking about getting out the door? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I re and I really think the answer depends. Uh, it's really company specific. I think being a public company uh, really exposes you to sort of the, the, the market overall and helps you become really disciplined and understands where you need to focus. Uh, one of the things about being private is, you know, you can be a little bit um, more loose in some of the ways that you look at your business. You may not get feedback directly on how the business is performing. Uh, in the public markets, you get you get feedback every single day on how you're how you're doing, the areas that people are concerned about, uh, and I think that can be a really valuable thing for the for the right companies open to that type of feedback uh, as they grow. Uh, you have this seven hundred million dollars plus of new dry powder here. Where are you looking within the tech space to put that to work? Are there certain industries that are more attractive for you right now? Yeah, we we try to be very thematic in the ways that we invest, and so our team today. Uh, is focused on a handful of areas that we're looking at for investments, and those would include things uh, around enterprise software, uh, cybersecurity, IT automation, and application development. Uh, and then on the media side, we're spending a lot of time in digital media, um, uh, in particular, and then consumer internet, particularly around consumer marketplaces. Lyft would be an example of that would fall into that latter category. KKR does have a great capital markets team. We do see them help take out companies. Lyft, are they an exit candidate via IPO? Do we see them publicly traded one day? Yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, you know we have companies at different maturity levels within the portfolio, and when they're candidates, when they're of that size and scale of maturity, uh, where they can start thinking about a public offering, I think having an in-house capital markets team that has an alignment of interest with the company is just a really valuable and differentiated resource. I think Lyft's at an interesting stage itself where you know, it can start contemplating you know, are there advantages to being out in the public market, uh, both for the company itself and then for the industry overall vis-a-vis -vis the competition. So maybe we see a Lyft IPO one day with the help of KKR Capital Markets. Emily, back to you. All right, Alex Barinka, our IPO reporter with Vincent Letary, KKR Growth Equity Director for Tech, Media, and Telecom. Coming up, we meet the VC trying to put Chicago on the tech map. This is Bloomberg. Walmart gained momentum in its fight against Amazon. The company reported first quarter results on Thursday and reported its online sales are growing at the fastest clip in at least five years. The e-commerce giant saw gross merchandise volume soaring 69% in the first quarter. Investors cheered the news, sharing share, shares of Walmart climbing to the highest level in nearly two years in the session. Last week, we took a deep dive into the tech scene in Boston, Massachusetts. Now we're focusing on Chicago. We spoke with Constance Friedman, founder and managing partner of Modern Ventures. Modern is based in the city and recently closed on a $33 million early stage venture fund. The firm invests in tech companies serving in sectors like real estate, home service markets. 
We discussed how the tech landscape looks in Chicago and how it's different from Silicon Valley. You know, the Chicago tech scene has really picked up in a lot of ways over the number of years. There's a great VC community here. There's a lot of great tech startups that are around here. And, you know, really as an investor, if you're willing to go outside of Silicon Valley and you're willing to go outside of the coast, you actually can find some really good deals. So, and, and it's, a, it's a great place to actually start a business because it's about a third of the cost of living to be in Chicago than it is some of the other, uh, some of the other cities, New York and San Francisco. Uh, meanwhile, a lot of great talent and, like I said, good VC community and so on. Um, you know, for us, for Modern, you know, we, we love investing in Chicago companies, but we do have uh, investments all across the country. You know, I think that what, what we're really unique on is some of the sector focus that we have. Um, we really focus on technology companies that are at the intersection of real estate, finance, insurance, and home services. And we look to look at companies often outside of those industries and bring them inside the industries. And so while we love investing in Chicago companies, like I said, we, we go all over. And you know, one of the things that's really unique about us is that we, as a venture firm, are really focused on helping to bring customers to our companies. There's probably really no other firm like that. Um, we have created a network of about 400 or so executives within these industries that we focus on, people who really understand that technology and innovation is something that they need to focus on to create their own competitive advantages. And what we do through a couple of different things, our fund and something we call the Modern Passport, we really create a bridge and bring our companies through an industry immersion program to connect those companies with executives in our industries. What does Silicon Valley have to learn from Chicago? One of the interesting things about coming out of your own backyard if you're in Silicon Valley is that there's plenty of interesting uh, companies that exist. And you know, again, coming from the focus that we come from, more traditional industries of where we're looking at technologies that are disrupting them, um, you can look at things like you know, the, the smart home example that I gave, you know, if you're starting to look at um, how that affects insurance, you know, being smart about data and being smart about smart homes, you can start to have companies like Hippo Insurance, for example, that are, you know, really um, changing how a homeowner can interact with, uh, prices can come down and you can get, uh, you can get insurance, um, you can get insurance in, in minutes, not hours. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess really the things that Silicon Valley has to learn from Chicago is that there are um, plenty, of, plenty of other companies out there. And, and I think what I said earlier is that, you know, when you come down to fundamentals and thinking about, you know, how, uh, how a company is um, uh, approaching these different industries, there's, there's, there's a lot outside of, uh, outside of Silicon Valley that's doing really well also. <laughs> Constance Friedman there, founder and managing partner of Modern Ventures from Chicago. And before we go out, a word on T-Mobile. T-Mobile CFO says the most logical partner for a tie-up is Sprint. He spoke in New York Thursday saying both companies could more cheaply deploy airwaves in a future 5G network to better compete with Verizon and AT&T. T-Mobile, the fastest growing U.S. carrier, is gearing up for consolidation and figures to be a key player in potential deals. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Friday's show, we'll be joined by Roger McNamee of Elevation Partners, always an exciting guest. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.